Hello, and welcome to the third update on the development of the Davenport Flood Resiliency Plan. This presentation will first recap previous community feedback and the city's experience at river levels of 18 and 22 feet. We will then provide an overview of the recommended elements within the draft plan to build resilience to flooding for the city of Davenport. The consulting team of H.R. Green, Sasaki, and Shai Hattery has been working for the past year to assist the city in developing a plan that will improve resiliency, increase operational efficiency, and enhance transportation routes during Mississippi River flood events. As we've described in previous presentations, this study has several components. It includes engaging with the public and stakeholder groups, considering land use changes and mitigation alternatives to increase resiliency to flooding, reviewing the city's flood operations plan to identify areas for improvement, considering transportation, safety, and mobility access across the city during flood events, and finally, putting together a funding and implementation strategy that will become the heart of the plan moving forward. We began our work last August with a robust data collection and analysis effort. This included reviewing data provided by the city, as well as gathering input from the public and a variety of stakeholder groups. Over the winter, we took that information and worked with the city to develop draft goals and concept alternatives for the flood resiliency plan. This spring, we reached out to the public and stakeholder groups again to gather feedback on that work. With that feedback in hand, we've been refining the concept alternatives into draft recommendations for the plan. Let's begin with a brief recap of the project to date and the information presented previously. Considering the input from the public and working with the city, we developed a set of guiding principles to reference when developing flood resilience concepts. The four goals are listed here. Starting with resilience, we want to reduce the impact of flooding on day-to-day -day lives and economies, including the ability to recover more quickly from a flood event. We also want to reduce the operational drain that flood fighting has on the city's resources. In making improvements, there is a desire to do so in a way that provides a balanced investment in flood mitigation and flood fighting effort across the full riverfront. And finally, public access to the riverfront as a public amenity needs to be prioritized. Earlier this year, we presented four types of structural flood mitigation strategies aimed at reducing or avoiding the impacts of flooding. These included underground backflow prevention in the storm sewer system, raised roads, flood walls, and landscape berms or levees. Other non-structural mitigation strategies, such as changes to regulations and zoning, flood warning and response plans, buyouts, or the flood proofing of individual buildings were not presented in detail. These non-structural mitigation strategies will be part of the final plan, but they are not being presented for feedback today. We also discussed how mitigation strategies are used in combination with one another, depending on a variety of criteria. It is unlikely that one structural mitigation strategy would be used exclusively, and very likely that a combination of strategies will be deployed. At the lower river stages, underground improvements to the sewer system and road raises can have a lot of impact, whereas flood walls and berms become more important tools at higher flood stages. For very tall mitigation measures, flood walls tend to dominate the alternatives due to the lack of space that would be required for the other types of infrastructure. We also discussed how structural mitigation improvements could be made with either of two quite different visions in mind for the future of flood resiliency in Davenport. The first vision may look to continue Davenport's history of flood response, but to make permanent incremental improvements that would increase resilience, improve access, and reduce flood fighting effort and costs, while not creating any sort of continuous riverfront flood protection system. This strategy would tend to focus more heavily on storm sewer and roadway improvements and would have relatively lower capital costs. The second strategy might envision setting a target flood elevation for the entire riverfront and build a continuous flood mitigation system that would come at a much higher upfront cost but would greatly reduce flood fighting efforts. <laughs> 
the options really run along a continuum from more incremental infrastructure improvements all the way to significantly transforming large portions of the riverfront for permanent flood mitigation purposes. Finally, we presented a variety of infrastructure options to gather feedback, sharing a few examples of the possible combinations of strategies that can be used to address flooding at any of the flood levels. Let's move on now to summarize the feedback we have received so far from the community. Last fall, we started by asking some big picture questions about flooding, the city's flood response efforts, and people's relationship to the river and the place where they live and work. We then started to identify some major themes in the responses. We next asked the community about their priorities for the development of the flood plan. We heard that the plan should include permanent infrastructure that doesn't require much to operate during a flood and requires less maintenance. People want the plan to prioritize commercial as well as residential areas and to provide protection to the highest level possible. Finally, we asked respondents to compare types of potential flood infrastructure and express what they do and do not like about the various options. There is strong support for underground improvements as a cost-effective and near-term flood fighting measure, but concerns that these improvements will only address relatively lower river stages and may involve a lot of maintenance. There is likewise good support for berms and road raises as permanent and relatively low maintenance flood mitigation measures that might be incorporated into the surrounding landscape and public opportunities along the riverfront. There are concerns, however, that these above ground features will impact river views and impede Mississippi River floodwaters. Flood walls, while permanent and low maintenance, have the least support, with people citing lack of public amenity co benefits and similar concerns over viewshed and river impacts as berms and road raises. To summarize, the community direction we received for the draft flood plan includes strong support for a permanent solution that doesn't require operation during a flood event, a desire for solutions that are lower maintenance so that they are reliable for the long term, a landform berm preferred over a flood wall for structural solutions where possible because of the opportunity for co-public benefits, a desire for city funds to be invested in long-term solutions with anticipation of more frequent flooding in the future, and finally, a shared feeling that reliable protection of access is critical for supporting businesses and inviting more investment. Before we get into the flood plan recommendations, let's briefly review flood risk and the impacts of major flooding along the Davenport Riverfront. Referring to the city's flood inundation maps, we can see that at flood stage 18, there are significant impacts to the riverfront parks and river drive, and that flooding occurs in low-lying locations even away from the river due to water backing up through the underground storm sewer system and surcharging onto the roadway. A significant effort in flood fighting is made by the city at or below flood stage 18 as well. In fact, over half of the city's flood response actions occur at or below flood stage 18, representing a substantial investment of manpower and materials. By stage 22, the flooding extends well inland of the seawall, significantly impacting transportation routes, access to the arsenal and centennial bridges, and many homes and businesses. Having reviewed the information presented earlier, we'll now turn to the draft recommendations for the Flood Resiliency Plan. We'll go through the recommended improvements in four sub areas of the riverfront shown here, starting with area one on the east end and moving downstream to area four on the west end. Starting in the village of East Davenport, we see at flood stage 18, the river is starting to impact the low-lying ditches along the railroad and adjacent to East River Drive. This river water backs up unimpeded through the underground storm sewer system. River water begins to come out of the intakes around flood stage 19.5, inundating the road. The city must then close River Drive and reroute traffic on a detour around the East Village. 
the plan proposes to raise River Drive east and west of Mound Street for approximately 1,600 feet of reconstruction. This will allow the city to keep East River Drive open for traffic until the seawall upstream of the dam is overtopped. Reconstructing the road may also allow for an improved gateway and pedestrian connections into the East Village. Future improvements in this area could include a permanent pump station to use in place of the temporary pumps currently deployed by the city during a flood event. Moving downstream now, let's look at area two, including the riverfront from East 4th Street down to Modern Woodman Park. By flood stage 18, the city would have already erected the flood wall panels around the ballpark and deployed flood fighting measures such as HESCO barriers and temporary pumps. But floodwaters would have inundated most of the riverfront parks, surcharged up through the storm sewer system and closed River Drive throughout this area. By stage 22, Floodwaters push further north and traffic is detoured around downtown. Public facilities along the riverfront are no longer accessible. The next two slides show six elements that make up the flood mitigation recommendations for Area 2. The first part would install backflow prevention on the storm sewer systems between Federal and 3rd Streets to prevent surcharge onto the roadway that begins to occur at stage 17.2 and closes East River Drive. This would allow the city to maintain access east on River Drive to and from downtown until the seawall is overtopped. The second project would elevate LeClaire Street from the Arsenal Bridge ramp north past 3rd Street to maintain access without flood fighting up to stage 22. Moving further west, third project would consolidate storm sewer serving the downtown floodplain area into an interceptor line with a single gate for backflow prevention. This would greatly reduce both the city's flood fighting efforts that begin at stage 16.5, as well as the amount of flow the city would need to pump in rainfall events during a flood. The fourth project includes a permanent line of flood protection north of the railroad tracks from the Arsenal Bridge west toward Gaines. This alignment would include a mix of landforms and flood wall integrated into the public park space. Temporary closures would be required across River Drive at the east end and at the north-south rail crossings. As such a large project, this would likely be built in phases, but could provide immediate and increasing benefits over time as the plan is constructed. In the interim, the city would be able to deploy flood fighting measures that would tie into high ground to the north. The flood mitigation recommendations allow for the construction of new park elements such as those that have been proposed as part of the Main Street Landing Plan. Construction of the park could occur with the flood mitigation work or at a later time. Park areas south of the tracks may be raised for certain uses, but generally this area would be allowed to flood, leaving floodplain area for the river. Finally, construction of one or more automated permanent pump stations in this area would replace temporary pumping and greatly reduce the manpower required for flood response. This closer view shows how the flood mitigation improvements become part of the overall park elements planned for this area. Moving on now to area three, let's look at the riverfront from Gaines to just past Division. By flood stage 18, areas of the riverfront parks are impacted and river water has been surcharging out of the storm sewer intakes onto West River Drive since below stage 15. By flood stage 22, the river has reached further inland, has Second Street in some locations, and traffic is detoured north around this area. Access to the city's public works facility at Marquette Street is also severely impacted. Recommendations in this area start with near-term improvements to the storm sewer system. These improvements will help maintain the use of West River Drive until higher flood stages when the river encroaches overland up through the parks. The storm sewer will be reconfigured for two purposes. First, so that all low-lying floodplain storm intakes are behind backflow prevention gates. And second, to reduce the drainage areas that must be pumped in a rainfall event during a flood. Following completion of the preliminary storm sewer improvements, 
four elements complete the mitigation recommendations up to stage 22. The landform and flood walls from area two are continued along the north side of the railroad tracks through area three, following an alignment of existing berms so as to have less impact to views and park use. The alignment turns south along Marquette Street and then west into high ground in Veterans Memorial Park. Temporary closures across the railroad tracks and South Marquette Street will be required. While Veterans Memorial Park sits on high ground, it is likely that underground seepage improvements will need to be made across this area, and these have been counted for in the plan. Part three continues the alignment of landforms and flood walls west from Veterans Memorial Park, culminating in a temporary closure across West River Drive before tying into high ground to the west. The city's existing pump station at Howell Street is located landward of this alignment. Finally, replacing temporary pumping efforts with automated permanent pump stations would reduce the flood response efforts in Area 3. The recommended flood mitigation elements have little impact to how the park is experienced today. They maintain access to the boat ramp except during floods and can blend into future park improvements. As with Area 2, these projects would likely be built in phases, but could provide immediate and increasing benefits over time as the plan is constructed, with the ability for the city to deploy flood fighting measures that would tie into high ground to the north in the interim. After completion of the recommended projects in Areas 2 and 3, River Drive can remain open up to flood stage 22 from the west closure near Howell Street to the east closure near Iowa Street. Moving downstream into West Davenport, flooding at stage 18 impacts the garden addition and low-lying areas adjacent to West River Drive. By this point, South Concord Street and the causeway to Credit Island are already underwater, but flooding has not yet entered Credit Island Lodge. By stage 22, Floodwaters cover large sections of West River Drive, as well as additional areas north of the railroad, but the berms along Blackhawk and Walnut Creeks are not overtopped. Recommendations for Area 4 begin with improvements to the storm sewer system in the Garden Addition. This is to eliminate multiple outfalls to Blackhawk Creek and reduce the number of locations where a variety of gates need to be closed and pumping needs to occur then storm sewer would be consolidated into a single gate well and outfall near the existing pump station, and dry detention areas would be added to attenuate peak flows and facilitate pumping operations. The garden addition sits behind existing flood mitigation infrastructure in the form of berms along Blackhawk and Walnut Creeks. These berms would be improved to meet current levee design standards for recommendations from previous studies. The tops of the existing berms ranged from approximately stage 24 to 26. This work would also include a better tie-in for temporary closure at the Concord Street Bridge. In addition to the rehabilitation work, a levee would be extended along the east side of the garden addition to close off the area to floodwaters from the east. Finally, the existing borough's pump station would be replaced with an upgraded permanent pump station. Like the other areas, there are opportunities for enhanced recreation elements adjacent to the flood mitigation improvements in West Davenport. The Credit Island Causeway could be improved with larger culverts or partially replaced with a bridge to allow more flow to enter the slough. This would provide ecological as well as recreational benefits along Credit Island. The park space within the Garden Addition could also be enhanced and connected via trails to the riverfront and to the west. The recommended improvements in Area 4 will provide reliable flood mitigation infrastructure for this neighborhood. These projects can be incorporated into other planning efforts in West Davenport for improved nature-based recreation. This list of recommended improvements outlines a long-term plan to improve flood resiliency in the city of Davenport. Projects will need to be phased over time, but there are several simpler incremental projects that can be completed in the near term in a matter of a few years.
completion of the storm sewer and roadway improvements that are elements of the overall plan would quickly provide improved access to the Arsenal and Centennial bridges and allow the city to delay the start of flood fighting in many areas until higher river stages. This would reduce both disruption to the public and labor costs. Capitalizing on these strategic early projects, the city could establish a permanent detour route across Davenport that would be open to stage 22. In the long term, as the mitigation elements are built out, the city will be able to reduce the number of flood fighting actions required. Eventually, a comprehensive flood mitigation system, including levees, flood walls, removable closures, stormwater pump stations, and seepage mitigation would be established to stage 22, significantly improving access across the city and reducing flood risk and disruption to public infrastructure, businesses, and residents. The recommended improvements are integrated into existing and future public access and recreation opportunities along the riverfront. While the risk of higher floods always remains, major flood impacts will be deferred to the very largest flood events. The city retains the ability to incorporate non-structural mitigation solutions, to deploy temporary flood fighting measures if needed, or to build higher in the future for anticipated floods. Now that you've seen a draft of the overall flood plan recommendations, we'd like your feedback. Do the recommendations reflect your priorities and input? Do you have any concerns about phasing and implementation of the plan? Please access the public survey using the web link shown on the right hand side of the screen. Once we gather and review your feedback, we'll be making final refinements to the plan this fall, detailing out the funding and implementation strategy and preparing a final flood resiliency plan document for consideration and adoption by the City Council.